This is Wickham Sound. Hello everyone, it is 7pm on Tuesday, so that means it's time for the art show here on Wickham Sound 106.6 FM. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is a show where we talk about the local art scene, we play a bunch of local music... And we get a different guest on each week to join us as well to talk about whatever field of creativity they're involved in. So this week we will be joined by Matt Sears, who is a local filmmaker. He's made some horror films, a few travel shorts as well. I actually know Matt because I used to work with him back in the day at an agency called FST in Marlow. Shout out to the FST lot. Matt's got a new film out called The Sky, and so we'll be talking to him about that. That was actually written by a guy called Ryan Grundy, who also used to work with us. And he also has a movie out called I Heard It Too, which has had about 6 million views on YouTube now. So we're going to be talking about that, a little bit about the creative process and what he's been up to since the lockdown as well. If you want to get in touch with me at the studio, you can email me on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N. And I want to hear from you if you're a local artist, writer, actor... Pretty much anything goes, anything artsy I want to hear from you. But in particular I am of course looking for local music to play on the show. And yeah, this week I have something I want to talk about because it's been the launch of my new novel. So in my uh, non-radio career I'm a writer, I work from home as a freelance writer during the day and then write books in the evening. And so last Friday, Friday the 10th of April, it was the launch day for my new novel. It's called The Tower Hill Terror. It was going to be called Netflix and Kill, but basically we couldn't, you know, Netflix owns the trademark and they they weren't about to let a small publishing house use the Netflix trademark in a novel about a serial killer. So what's kind of annoying about that actually is that on Goodreads there are about six different books already out there all called Netflix and Kill, but they were all self-published and I suppose they didn't worry too much about lawyers ringing them up and knocking on the door. So The Tower Hill Terror is the second book in a series called the Lightfold series. It follows a private detective called James Lightfold and his sort of gothy gamer girl computer nerd assistant I suppose. So he's about 40 odd and she's early 20s and so they have very different skill sets. You know he's very old school and would use things like the yellow pages which I can barely remember because I'm a millennial. Sorry if you can hear some background noise. My cat is here again. He always likes to come out when we're on the radio and he wants to say hello. So Miley and Lightfold kind of team up to bust bad guys basically. It's kind of like a quirky take on uh, you know the classic cozy mystery. So I describe it as a bit like Miss Marple if Miss Marple used Facebook, you know. So later on in the show I'm going to be doing a reading for my new book. It's called The Tower Hill Terror. It's book 2. So I guess I should talk about what they're about. The first book is called Driven. And basically, that's about a strange murder in which someone gets hit by a car, but it seems as though there was nobody in the driving seat. And that kind of really sets the scene when it introduces the characters. And then this new one, Netflix and Kill. Basically, there's a serial killer on the loose, and Miley and Lightfold team up to try and kind of help the police and also run their own little investigation to try and make their name, because, you know, times are hard and business isn't exactly booming. Both of the books are kind of... I wouldn't say funny, but they've got like an edge of humour to them, I suppose. And they're not like super gory or anything like that. So kind of can be enjoyed by the whole family, I guess. And uh, yeah, you don't have to read them in order either. So you could just go straight to the Tower Hill Terror if you so desire. Definitely check it out if you need something to read at the moment. Because, you know, support indie authors. One thing I will say is that the book should be available in both paperback and digital copies from Amazon. I don't know whether Amazon is actually shipping physical copies at the moment because I know they were going to focus on emergency supplies, which is fair enough. But that is enough self-promo, at least for now. So uh, I'm going to give a little shout out here. So this is my old neighbour. Tom is a bass guitarist. He's in a band called Superlord. We're going to play one of their tracks in a moment. And he put up with a lot of rubbish from me because I'd be there at like 9, 10 p.m. in the evening, you know, recording music and stuff. I had a full drum kit in the house as well. And I can't really play drums. And there's nothing worse than listening to somebody play drums who can't play drums. Unless I guess it's like actually violin, bagpipes, saxophone. I suppose all of those are pretty bad. Fortunately, the drummer for his band is a lot better than I will ever be at drums. So here we go. This is Wait by Superlord, and it's a bit nuts. Check it out.
is Wickham Sound. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound or online at wickhamsound.org. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I have a new book out. So last Friday, Friday the 10th of April, my new book, The Tower Hill Terror, was published by Encircle Publications. It's the second book in my little cosy detective series, the Lightfold series. And so in today's show, in the hope that maybe you'll like this and go and grab a copy... (laughs) Uh, I'm going to read you a little bit of an excerpt. So this is chapter two and it introduces a few of the different characters. Chapter two, the old Vic. Gary Mogford was about to knock off when the call came in. It was a Friday evening and he was ready for the weekend. He was on call, but he knew from experience that the crime rate would drop because it was cold, wet and rainy. But someone had screwed it all up by reporting a corpse in a hotel room. And then a helpful young lady called Karen had led him up to the third floor of the Grosvenor House Hotel, where a guilty-looking James Lightfold was dragging a concierge, spitting, cursing and still spewing, out into the hallway. James Lightfold, Mogford said, as Constable Jenny Groves grimaced and fingered her handcuffs beside him. Fancy seeing you here. We're going to need you to make a statement. Back at the Old Vic, the 19th century police station that still housed two-fifths of the city's woefully underfunded coppers, Mogford checked in with his boss. He found Chumley in the empty canteen. The governor was hiding out with a stack of paperwork, trying to make a dent in it without being disturbed every ten minutes by a knock on the door. Ah, Chumley said, marking his place with a finger at the end of a paragraph. Mogford, how can I help you? Bad news, boss, Mogford replied. A body's been found at the Grosvenor House Hotel. Your old pal James Lightfold was at the scene. I thought you might want to have a word with him. What happened? he asked. Who was killed? Looks like Jane Lipton, Gov. Remember her? We got men on the ground to secure the scene and the body's on its way to the coroner. Lightfall was there when I arrived, boss, dragging their receptionist away from the crime scene. Is there any chance that the receptionist was behind it? Doesn't look like it, Mogford said. He needed a change of underwear if you catch my drift. Doesn't seem the type to kill a fly. Nevertheless, it's a possibility. Mogford said nothing and Chumley sighed and looked shrewdly across at his second in command. Okay, Chumley said. You speak to the hotel staff and see what you can figure out. I'll have a chat with James Lightfold. But you know what he's like. He's always in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was the following day, a Saturday afternoon, and Lightfold had just escaped a stressful meeting with a new client. He unlocked his mobile phone and dialed the office. Are you busy? Lightfold asked when Miley answered the call. Miley laughed. The phone hasn't stopped ringing. You'd better be paying me time and a half. Can you meet me at the Rose and Crown? Sure thing. Just give me a couple of minutes to power down. What's up? I'm not convinced that the Thompson case is over, Lightfold replied. And besides, I could murder a lemonade. Lightfold arrived first, and he went up to the bar and ordered a lemonade, a gin and tonic and a pint of lager before selecting a discreet booth in the corner. Lightfold sat with his back to the wall, an old habit that allowed him to keep an eye on the doors. It was a useful surveillance trick, but it also came in handy if he had to make a quick getaway. Miley arrived ten minutes later, dressed all in black but still showing a slight lick of colour that Lightfold struggled to place until he realised she'd had her fringe done. He wondered how she'd found the time. She spotted Lightfold at his table and made a beeline for the booth. Hey, she said, pulling out a chair and sitting down beside him. What's new? This is for you, Lightfold said, sliding the G&T across to her. He kept the other two drinks for himself. Miley stared at him as he took a slow sip from the lemonade before picking up the lager, sniffing it, swirling it delicately and putting it back down on the table. And that one's for you? she asked. I don't drink, Lightfold reminded her. Not anymore. But sometimes, when I feel like I've earned one, I buy something to remind me what I'm missing. Uh Uh-huh, Miley said. Because that's totally sane. You're not missing much. Perhaps not, Lightfold murmured, staring moodily at the drink. He took another sip of his lemonade and said, It looks like we've got another murder on our hands. Yeah, huh, Miley said. Jane Lipton. Who do you think killed her? Is it connected to the Thompson case? I don't know, Lightfold admitted. It could be, but something tells me it's unrelated. The ferocity of the attack for one thing, the modus operandi for another. Lightfold took another sip from his lemonade while Miley slurped away at her G&T. Then he stared morosely into the pint of lager. So what's next? Miley asked, breaking the moody silence with an upbeat smile. The same as always, Lightfold replied. We investigate and if we can make some money while we're at it, even better. Doesn't look like we'll be short of work for a while. Lightfold nodded and said nothing. Miley grinned again and leaned towards him. I wouldn't miss it for the world, she said. She sat back and down the rest of her G&T. Then she pointed at the pint of lager that Lightfold was still brooding over. 
You gonna drink that? She asked. So yeah, that is from the Tower Hill Terror. So that's out now on Amazon and other leading publishers and whatnot on paperback and ebook formats. So that's my new book. And our guest today has a new film, and so we're going to be talking to him about that in a little bit. First off, though, let's have a little bit of music. So this is A Fine Wine I Am by Occasionally David. I know one half of Occasionally David, Clive Whitelock. He's obviously been staying at home a lot recently because he's on the the high-risk list at the moment. But uh, he has been listening to the show, so shout out to you, Clive. Uh, Also, fun fact, I was getting a tattoo at Black Dahlia Inc. When was this? Like September of last year. And I'd been in there for like an hour and a half, two hours, and this other guy was getting a tattoo. And everyone was chatting along. And then I realized who he was. Somebody said something, and um, I realized it was Ash Whitelock. It was Clive's son. So then we started chatting about that. It was a small world. So yeah, anyway, occasionally David.
love music, love talk, love Wickham Sound. Whatever career you're interested in, from film, music and the arts, to hair and beauty, construction, sports or healthcare, with Bucks College Group, you get more than a professional qualification, you get the Bucks College Factor. At our Aylesbury, Wickham and Amersham campuses, you'll benefit from state-of-the-art facilities with expert tuition and real industry experience. Something that top employers and universities are crying out for. Bucks College Factor. Search Bucks College Group. From the 1st of April, your new Buckinghamshire Council will replace the existing county and district councils and continue to deliver all the services you are used to. Visit buckinghamshire.gov.uk. Saturday nights from 8pm till 10pm. Live in Studio 2 from the centre of High Wycombe. It's Kev Kinch in the house. It's Saturday night. This is Kev Kinch in the house. Right, it's Saturday night. Let's do this. Hi, this is Kev Kinch and I will be playing you the very best in house and dance music on your local radio station, Wickham Sound, from 8pm this Saturday night. I'll also be playing the very best reworks of those favourite old school tunes. So that's this Saturday from 8pm. Turn up the volume and mind your bass spins, by the way. With Kev Kinch, your Saturday night soundtrack is sorted. This is a journey into sound. The music just turns me up. This is Wickham Sound. Last night I watched you sleeping Peaceful, barely breathing Kissed your forehead, stroked your hair You didn't even stir Were you dreaming of me? Someone I could never be With you I am complete You make sadness obsolete Protect me, infect me Warm me and perfect me So don't disrespect, neglect or reject me I love to watch you think See your face frowned with concentration Are you wondering if we Have a future or just history You I am complete You make sadness obsolete Define me
You're listening to 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. My name's Dane Cobain. This is The Art Show. And that was Colin Upfield with Complete. And we're going to be joined by Matt Sears, who is a local filmmaker. He's got a new movie out called The Sky, which you can check out on YouTube. And he's going to talk to us all about it. To get started then, do you want to sort of introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about your filmmaking when you first got started and, you know, how that's taken you through to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, God, man, yeah, that's quite a long story, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, my name's Matt Sears. I'm a filmmaker based just outside of London. Uh, been filmmaking probably since I was about 12. Uh, basically, I saw my cousin making films, and I was like, ah, looks like, looks like fun. So me and my best mate, we took his dad's video camera and then just started making our own like stupid little action films. And uh, just kind of went from there, really. And then I went to uni and learned about visual effects and stuff. And now I'm working in a creative agency in Marlow, which is actually where I met Dane. But yeah, outside of that, I'm still sort of pursuing filmmaking. I've just kind of carved out a bit of a niche in horror now, though. Uh, I've kind of gone away from action and gone gone into horror. Do you ever worry that you're sort of going to get pigeonholed as a as a horror filmmaker? Um, not not really. I, th- I think I, I really enjoy the genre. So if, if if that were to happen, I wouldn't be that upset. But I think I've done enough films kind of around it. Yeah. Um, horror is where I've been most successful, but I've done other stuff that kind of branches out into like maybe like sci-fi and drama and documentary and things like that. Um, if I find if that's sort of where I find my success, and then I can kind of build a career mm-hmm. that way, and then I think once you've established that, you can then start to kind of branch out. But I'm pretty happy with sort of horror at the moment. Yeah, that's fair enough. And I mean as well. As you say, you've done a lot of kind of other stuff on your own steam. So, for example, you, you do your travel videos when you go traveling as well. <laughs> yeah. And I, one, one question I wanted to ask, like quite a topical one, where, where's going to be first on your sort of travel destination list once all travel restrictions are lifted? And yeah, hopefully I was about you can to say once to we're allowed out of the house. Yeah. Um, where have we been? I wanted to go to like the southern states, so like New Orleans. Um, I think that would be quite cool. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I was supposed to be going to Rome, right? Like, uh, last weekend. Yeah. But obviously, that all got cancelled. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't the travel films. I don't find that much time to do them. Yeah. Because like film, like just like um, sort of narrative film and stuff, sort of kind of takes over because that's where I need to put most of my effort. The the one good thing about this quarantine is that I've actually been able to go back and do loads of like old films and stuff. So I've yeah. been going back to to travel films that I'd filmed and never never bothered editing yeah yeah um, I mean yeah, I can I think, imagine that's quite therapeutic as well when you you know you can't get out of the house and you can kind of sort of look back yeah. at some of the places you've been and think well you know it's not all yeah, bad all the time it's like a sort of a little escape really like escape from your from your flat because it's you get to go and visit these places again and yeah. kind of remember and it's I mean it's not quite the same as going out on holiday again but it'll it'll do for now yeah yeah <laughs> I don't know whether you were expecting me to ask you about this one, but you uh, did a cowboy music video. Yeah, so <laughs> that was when I was trying to raise money for Movember. Mm-hmm. So I said if I got, I think it was £250, then I would do this music video as like an incentive to get people to, to give me the money. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think like on the last day I was I had like, I think it was like 50 quid I'd raised or something so yeah. like nowhere near enough and then, and then Tim was like I just want you to do the music video and then he just donated yeah. 200 pounds <laughs> oh Tim sorry Tim being the guy that I started making films with. yeah he's uh, new, new Flight Productions right yeah yeah he's yeah, still, he's still pictures, going yeah. yeah cool um, but yeah and he, just, he paid for like, the whole thing and then so yeah so I did this music video but that was, that was great I love country <laughs> music so um, yeah it was like living out a little dream getting to like Shave, have a moustache, yeah. wear a cowboy hat, and, and yeah, oh, great. and your your old car was in it as well, wasn't it? Yeah, Camilla was in it. Camilla, yeah, I so, had like a '92 Camaro at the time. I mean, I get, I yeah. guess it's a a good time in a way to release something new. Yeah, it, it is and it isn't. It, it's like because I just released the sky. Yeah, I thought, oh no, the this a good, really good time, and it is like for an online audience, it's mm. it's, it's quite good because there's obviously a lot more people on YouTube on 
and Vimeo and everything. But the certain avenues that you would use to kind of promote aren't there anymore. So, yep. so I would have done like maybe like ten festivals with it. Mm-hmm. But obviously now all the festivals are that you can't. All the festivals aren't running. Um, or if all they're kind of all up in the air, so you don't want to kind of put the money into yeah. something that's not necessarily going to go anywhere. But then also the like the contacts that you would have that you might that might help you promote it. They're kind of busy with their own thing or like um, yeah. So it's 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 good. And um, if you've already got that kind of that base of followers, it's really good. I think because they're just always kind of available. Yeah. But if you're if you're still kind of trying to promote stuff, it's I think it's quite tricky. Yeah. Still. Trying to trying to break out, you know, it's not probably not the best time for that. No, no, exactly. Yeah, and if yeah, it, I mean, especially at the, at the moment because I'm trying to um, get films sort of across the line in in LA and stuff. Yeah. Um, but obviously, like their whole industry is like ground to a halt. So trying to <laughs> trying to promote your films there and like get the the right people to see them is like it, it feels sort of a bit of a waste of time. I yeah. was hoping it would be a case of um like everyone's kind of got downtime and the sort of the opportunity to watch your stuff yeah. or like put effort into instead of putting effort into like production and stuff they're kind of putting effort into finding new people or whatever but i think it's just a case of everyone's like completely screwed so it's a really bad time to yeah. sort of start it, trying to promote yourself i mean it's it's all a bit up in the air as well because i mean one thing i was going to ask is um again with with everything sort of grinding to a halt a lot of the bigger movie houses are starting to look at things like you know online premieres and things like that and they're kind of yeah starting yeah, to look yeah. into the ways that maybe you as a more independent filmmaker that you would be using if that makes sense and i and i think nobody really yeah. knows what effect that's gonna have you know no i, th- I think I, th- I don't know yeah it, it, no one knows yet but i think one of the the good things that might come out of it is is the possibility for people like me who work with like a zero budget basically so then like if they come to you and they, well because obviously like they're going to take a massive hit financially mm-hmm. so on the one hand they're not maybe they're not going to want to take risks with filmmakers who aren't as well known but then on the other hand they might want to be like well if we can give this guy like 100 grand or whatever and it's like that's which is sort of nothing to them and mm-hmm. then they can make a big profit from them they might be like they've got sort of less money to throw around so they might be more willing to sort of i don't know try try sort of lower budget productions and things take a chance yeah <laughs> i guess again though when there's when there is all this uncertainty it, it is actually probably going to make people more willing to take a chance because it's you know everything's so uncertain anyway you could invest millions in a big blockbuster and it could still fail because you know the market yeah. conditions and yeah, stuff yeah one of the sorry no, okay, one of the reasons that um trying to sort of carve out a niche in horror and is because it, it's sort of it, it's so low budget and they're kind of nearly always not always successful but like financially they're kind of seen as quite low risk because yeah. there's there's such an audience for them and the money that you need to make them is so low so films like Blair Witch Project, Paranormal Activity, yeah. even, like they're they're kind of like the best examples. But Cloverfield even, probably wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, this this the budgets are really really low, and then yeah. the return is really high. So, like studios are more willing to take a risk on on horror than they are on sort of other genres. So obviously, you've just uh, you've just released The Sky. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I'd, I'd like to know as well how, how the writing process was like, because you worked with uh, Ryan on that, Ryan Grundy, right? Yeah, no, this guy, this guy is basically, it's a cosmic horror film, so it's about the end of the world, and it's about two friends who decide to spend their final moments together playing Never Have I Ever, and it comes across, <laughs> it comes up that one of them uh, goes, Never Have I Ever taken shrooms. So then they they take these shrooms because why not? It's the end of the world. They might as well. And um and then everything goes a bit crazy from there. Um, it's a good <laughs> setting for it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's, that's what I, another thing I thought. Like, oh, it's a, it's a great time to release it. Yeah. Then maybe it isn't because maybe people don't want to watch a film about the end of the world. Yeah. They want to watch something happy instead. <laughs> well, I will say actually, um, I saw on Spotify that Spotify had released data on like what new songs people were listening. And there was a huge yeah. spike in uh, "It's the End of the World as We Know It" by REM. So, oh really? Yeah. So I guess people have got a sense of humour about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's cool. I mean, 
I've been working on it for a, about a year, mm -hmm. which is far too long, really. It's just it, it's been a bit of a mental process, but um, basically, I think like I was just playing around with some like software and effects techniques at work and stuff, and I made this kind of sci-fi looking thing with like these really cool like sky effects and things. And I um, showed it to Ryan. He's like, "Oh yeah, it's really cool." And I think Annihilation had just come out at the time as well. And I'm um, really inspired by that. And yeah, we sort of, me and Ryan, kind of came up with this idea together about about the end of the world and sort of we were these two friends. And then Ryan went around, wrote the script and everything. Um, and yeah, and then it was like pretty quick between Ryan writing the script and then finding our actors and starting filming. But then just it's, it's a really really effects heavy yeah. heavy film so that just took the, like 90% of the time was post production on it so I mean I want to talk about some of your other films as well I've got a few in mind uh, yeah. so I guess we start with um, I Heard It Too which is sort of I guess is that your is that your most viewed film oh yeah by by a by mile yeah <laughs> so so, um, so how did that one come about that one started with um, like a short like a short horror story didn't it like a short horror story yeah prompt. yeah, yeah. So, i mean I was, I was just like bored one night and i was just going through like i think it was like creepy pasta or something and um there was a list of it was like 10 two sentence horror stories and i was reading through it it's really cool and then yeah and then one of them was i heard it too so it's just two lines and it was um a girl hears her mum calling her from downstairs when she gets to the top of the stairs her mum grabs her and pulls into the other room and says i heard it too or something along those those lines so there's basically an imposter downstairs that sounds exactly like her mum, and I was like, "Oh, that's terrifying." Yeah. So like, it was literally right after I read that little story, I just put like a script together and based it on on that. And uh, yeah, and again, that was like really, really quick. I just sort of, I really loved that little story, and it was really good. And I just wanted to wanted to make it basically. Sweet. Um, I like entered it into like a couple of festivals and stuff, and there was. One, it was the BFI Future Film Festival, and it was called it was called Unscreened. There was like a um, part of it which was called Unscreened, and it was for loads of films that hadn't hadn't been screened at festivals yet. Um, so I entered it into that, and it got screened at the Prince Charles Theatre in in London, which was really cool. Um, with a bunch of other films. So, but then after that, it was kind of I was like, oh, I was pretty happy with it doing that. And then you actually advised me to put it on YouTube because it was just on my Vimeo at the time. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, there yeah, might as well because there's a much bigger audience on YouTube. And I put it on there, and then like it, it was sort of drifted around the like ten thousand views mark for like a year or something, and then it just literally ex exploded like overnight more or less, and it just like gathered so much momentum, and it's on like six million views now. <laughs> it's crazy. And so in that one, um, so you worked with like a child actor in that one, I suppose. So how was that to work with like a younger actress? <laughs> Um, really di difficult actually they, there's like a reason why they say never work with animals or children um, it, like it, it's just I think it's because not, obviously this was we were doing this um, like no no budget mm -hmm. so I was just paying for their like food and kind of stuff like that um, so she doesn't really it's not like she's getting paid or anything <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. incentive to be there um, but yeah, her mum, uh, I can't remember how I met her, uh, her and her mum actually, um, but yeah, basically uh, she was like a member of like, all these like, amateur dramatic things, but she was only like, I think she was like four or mm -hmm. five at the time, which is like really, really young, and um, but yeah, her mum was like, oh no, she's really good and I really want to get her in sort of more into acting and stuff, um, but, and it's, it's fine for like the first maybe like two takes. Yeah. But if she doesn't do it right, then you need to keep getting her to do the the same thing again. Obviously, she's like she doesn't quite because she's so young. Yeah, doesn't, doesn't understand, understand why. Yeah, yeah. Like why? So you have to. So we ended up like bribing her with sweets, basically. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> like you do it works. This one more time, one more time, one more time. Yeah, and basically the, the way I edited the film was I actually used a lot of sort of takes where she didn't necessarily know we were filming. Yeah, yeah. So we might film it and kind of run it through, and she she behaved like and and did it perfectly when we weren't when we said we weren't recording yeah. as soon as we said we were recording she kind of play up yeah yeah um but one of the, the, the bad points about it is that obviously that took up like 80 percent of the time yeah yeah so when it came to filming all like the mother's bits 
we we had to like rush through them we couldn't get as many takes as we wanted and um and also like because it was so difficult to get the kids stuff when she would like get say her lines first time <laughs> the kind of the, it's almost like the performance bar had been set really low so when we saw hers we were like wow that's great yeah whereas like now in hindsight we're like oh actually we probably could have got her to do that a bit better and so like we just didn't have the time to to direct that that part of the performance but we still did like a really good job but i know that like it could have been a lot better yeah yeah um, but we just didn't because we didn't have the time and it was good yeah. though because it's always you know good to take something away that you can learn from as well yeah yeah exactly yeah so kids, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so i imagine it was a lot more fun to work on uh what was it was it charlie boy the one you did with your with your nan was the actress in it right yes i mean that was like the opposite yeah um so i gone from working with like a five-year-old to a 95-year-old yeah um but yeah like i'd always grown up and like me and my nan had made films together so i'd like had her as like the terminator and stuff yeah like that. yeah nice just kind of just like the novelty of having uh, a grandmother is like a robot or yeah. something like that kind of. but all my friends really love those films and then I kind of came up I can't remember how I came up with the idea but she also she basically she'd been suffering with this um, condition called Charles Bonnet or Bonnet Charles Bonnet syndrome yeah. which basically means uh, like as your eyesight deteriorates your your brain kind of fills in the gaps and you kind of imagine things that aren't there mm-hmm. So it could be like patterns or uh, like trees. She she said she used to see like the the old road where she lives and stuff, but like in her front room. And I was like, that's mental. Um, but then I started reading up about it, and some people have been seeing like horrible faces and mm. things like that. And I was like, oh, that's that's great. Um, so I decided to put this film together around that, and then and kind of the sort of fears of getting older and and being alone and things like that. Um, and yeah, but um, cause basically because she was so old when we, we did the film, instead of working around like a child's attention span, we were now working around like how long my nan could kind of stand up and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like obviously our movement was like really limited and and she'd get tired really quickly. Um, but she's like, she have never been so proud as like when we were making that film because she did the best job. Yeah, it was a great result, um, yeah. And yeah, and everyone literally everyone who watches is like, oh my god, she's like incredible, yeah. and, like carries it. Um, but yeah, that was that was really nice, like working with my nan on that and stuff. Um, and that's probably probably my most well received film. Like yeah. everyone who watches it, like it's hard not <laughs> it's hard not to kind of not really to be moved it. by it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And just one last question, which is just you know, uh, where can people find you, and what you're going to be working on next? Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, so. I think it's probably best to find me on on YouTube. So if you just type in Matt Sears into YouTube, I think my stuff comes up. Or uh, like Matt Sears, I heard it too, or Matt Sears Films. Um, and yeah, and I've got a channel on there. So very much appreciated if you could if you could go check out my stuff and subscribe and if you like it. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best place to find me. All right, so that was Matt Sears. His film was called The Sky. Be sure to check out on YouTube and uh, check out I Heard It Too as well. Both excellent movies. Love music. Love talk. Love Wickham Sound. Inspired to develop young minds. You could teach or instruct with Buckinghamshire College Group. We're recruiting for English, maths, construction and motor vehicle teachers, as well as construction instructors. You don't necessarily need a teaching qualification, as all required training will be provided, based at our Ellsbury, Wickham and Amersham campuses. If you're looking for a career that will challenge and develop you with excellent benefits, including pension and generous holidays and free parking, search Bucks College Group. For the latest news, reviews and sport, get your copy of the Bucks Free Press this Friday. Bucks Free Press, proudly reporting High Wycombe for 160 years. Hello, this is Chaz Large. Join me for a new jazz show here on Wycombe Sound. I'll be playing tracks from all the top names in jazz, from Glenn Miller to Courtney Pine, Count Basie to Michael Bublé. Not forgetting the all-time greats like Charlie Parker, Dinah Washington, Frank Sinatra and Dave Brubeck to name but a few. Listen out soon for Chaz on Jazz. This is Wickham Sound. Yeah. 
down When the hat you're really in town You chose to let it in Let it go so far And if taking it far Wins and wins wherever you want it You're asleep To the way it ought to be You are who you need You are who you need You will sleep You don't need Any reaction from those SOVs And you don't know you want Mindset at square one Same old song Same old version song No, there won't be any time for Sound. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. My name's Dane Cobain and that was Who You Need by Harry Quinn, who used to be an uh, open mic local, but alas, he's since moved away and is now self in self-isolation somewhere, but hopefully he's still listening to the show. So, hey, Harry. Okay, so we're at that part of the show now where I'm going to recommend some entertainment stuff to keep you guys going. So each week we recommend a book a movie or TV show and an album as well. For the book, I would like to recommend The Tower Hill Terror, my new book, but um, I don't want to be too self promo y. So instead, we're going to go for Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. So this is like a uh, post apocalyptic novel. It's actually eerily close to home. I picked this out because one of my friends. I asked her to pick out a random number. I basically have this like huge list of books that I want to read. So she picked out a few random numbers for me and I got the books that they corresponded to. And one of them was this one and it turns out to be set after a super flu wipes out most of America. So yeah, that was interesting. It follows this like band of bards who are kind of going around from post-apocalyptic town to town and putting on Shakespeare plays. 
and there's a lot of kind of hopping backwards and forwards through time as well so we see how this kind of epidemic came about but it's really eerily close to home to the point at which like one of the main characters was panic buying and bought an entire trolley full of uh, toilet paper which was yeah hit close to home you know for this week's movie slash tv show because i literally I don't, I don't think i've watched anything since last week i've just subsisted on wickham sound youtube spotify and i mean i guess audiobooks as well but because i haven't really watched anything we're going to go more old school and i'm going to recommend dig which is a documentary it's uh, directed by Andy timoner and it follows the brian jones sound massacre and the dandy warhols uh, two bands i don't i don't even want to try and describe their sound i don't know kind of like 60s revivalist in some ways but it follows these two bands during kind of the start of their career in like the Portland, Oregon scene. And it's just a really interesting music documentary, you know, uh, especially if you like the bands. I mean, the soundtrack of it is excellent, but I would say that because I like both bands. And I think uh, the first guest we had on here, Jordana Blake, uh, she's really into the Brian Jones Sound Massacre as well. So she would agree. Shout out to Jordana. And for this week's album, I, I know this is a bit of a stretch here, but bear with me. Basically, I've been trying to pick back up learning French. I've been using Duolingo, one of my friend's recommendations, and it's all right. Add me on there if you've got it, and you know me, I guess. <laughs> and um, so because of that, I've been listening to a lot more sort of foreign language music as well. I mean, I was listening to Stance Punks the other day, who are a Japanese punk band. They have a song called Mayanaka Shonen Totsugeki Dan, which, oh, what does it mean? I think it means like Brave Boys Charge Club or something. But... I really enjoy the album Mutter by Rammstein. I know it's German and not French, but Rammstein are like German industrial metal, I guess. And Mutter, for me, was their best album. It makes me feel like I'm about 15 again when I listen to it. And it's also perfect for if you're going on your one state-sponsored walk of the day and you want some sort of quite heavy post-apocalyptic feeling music to, um, you know, be the soundtrack of your walk, then Ramstein is probably a pretty good shout. Anyway, so we're almost out of time now, so I want to thank Matt Sears for joining me. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Emmanuel Fombu. He's not actually a Wickham local, but um, he's a client of mine, and he writes and talks about the future of healthcare. And so we're going to be talking about coronavirus, but specifically how it relates back to the performing arts and how, uh, you know, how arts are important for mental health. I've actually somehow still not met him face to face, even though he's in Europe and London and Berlin and stuff all the time. But uh, he's currently in New York City working kind of overtime in the hospitals as well, but doing a lot of good stuff to try and bring about a, a healthier, more preventative type of healthcare. It's going to be really interesting. He was on a radio show that I saw recently and he was so good on that that I thought we've got to get him on. If you do have any questions for him, then feel free to reach out to me at dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org. And also let me know if you're a local artist and you've got some tracks you'd like me to play as well. Anyway, that brings us about to the end of this week's show. Apologies if there's been any weird sound. It has been a nightmare, but we got through it, so that's what's important. I'm going to play you out now with another song by Fabless Parfait. This is called Gay Friend. I'll see you next week. <laughs> Yep.
happiest you think of all the shit, think about it as you. There's a front to make my sanity. You refuse to judge, you're just there for me. You are the right way, is this the hard to admit? Wickham Sound.